students to succeed. Guy K-12 is proud to sponsor this uh, session. And, and like I said, I'm Julie Fitzgerald. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Guy K-12. And uh, thank you for joining us. We really have a great session set up um, with just a few housekeeping tips that I want to touch on before we jump in. Uh, I do have the phones on mute, just so we have uh, less background noise for everyone. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel to type them in the chat box, and then we'll open up all the phone lines at the end for questions if you want to just ask them over the phone, but we can also um, answer them from the chat box as we go. But we will leave time for questions. Um, we have lots of people that are familiar with Guy K-12 on the line and lots of people that are new to Guy K-12 on the line. So I'm just going to give you a two-minute update on who Guy K-12 is and what we do. Um, we are a visual analytics software tool designed specifically for administrators and helping with district-level decisions. And Guy K-12 helps administrators with everything from looking at shifting populations, open enrollment tracking, resource placement, boundary change changes, um, really being able to have a, a easy to use tool at the fingertips of those closest to the decisions is what Guy K-12 is all about. The goal for our webinar today is really to start a, a open up a dialogue on the issue of equity and access to advanced coursework. It, uh, it is really to provide a context and background, as well as examples of districts that are making advances in this area. And then ultimately, we're going to highlight some tips and tools that can help districts begin their own journey. Um, and we'll talk about how Guy K-12 can help with that analysis. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Rob New. Rob has extensive education background and has spent the last 10 years as a superintendent. So he really knows firsthand the challenges that you all face in a district setting. So I just want to say thank you, Rob, for being here and for sharing all of this great content with us. Well, welcome. Webinar today. I'm super excited to be here and be a part of this conversation. Um, as Julie said, I'm a former superintendent, 27 year career educator, and I think the, the one area that always excited me most, what I was most passionate about, was equity and access for all of our students. And so today's conversation is not only uh, about preparing our students for their future, very uncertain future to say the least, but also how do we identify, reach, and engage all of our students and, and ultimately unleash the human potential in our students so that they can thrive and, and, and sort of not only uh, survive, but thrive in their future of great uncertainty. So what I wanted to do was kind of go through five uh, segments or chapters, if you will, a really brief, starting with a really brief historical perspective on American public education and kind of build a context uh, with, with what we are in still today. Uh, then, then talk about some future trends and some current data, and then issue a challenge statement to everyone. Um, I hope it's a, a statement or a challenge that is thought-provoking, um, maybe makes you a little uncomfortable, but also at the same time is inspirational. Then that will be supported by some success strategies as well as some current su success stories, and then conclude with some tools for taking action um, for moving forward. So when you think about it, over the past century or so, our world has moved from a whole lot of certainty and little change or change that was slow in coming to one where change is happening at warp speed. And when you take a drop back to American public education and, and its, its roots, um, back in 1776, not only were we at war, um, we're finishing our war um, with, the, with the British, but uh, Thomas Jefferson was serving in the Virginia House of Delegates, and he was tasked at the time for revising Virginia laws, uh, which were subject to approval by the General Assembly. From that, he came up with two really significant pieces of legislation. One was the bill for um, establishing religious freedom, and the other one, of course, was what he called a more general diffusion of knowledge, or what was the uh, Education Bill of 1782. Now, according to Jefferson, his proposal for the students or the children of Virginia were that all of them would receive three years of free public education, reading, writing, and common arithmetic. And according to, to Jefferson, and I put these in quotes, the boy of best genius would be moved on to 20 grammar schools throughout the Commonwealth while the residue was dismissed. Then after one or two more years, 
20, and he kind of called those a trial years, that 20 exceptional leaders would be, quote, raked from the rubbish annually and educated at public expense in Greek, Latin, geography, and higher mathematics. Then his goal was six more years, after six more years, half of those 20 boys would be dismissed from public schools and then those other 10 would be chosen for the superiority of their parts of dispositions, and I quote that, and sent on to his alma mater, the College of William and Mary, to study science. Um, what was interesting, and I didn't know until I was doing a little additional research, was that he uh, got disengaged with William and Mary, and uh, he uh, uh, f founded the University of Virginia in 1819. So kind of a little side note. So it, with that as our backdrop, that's kind of the, the, the sequence of, of the public education system that I, I think we still are in today, and, and certainly the system of select and sort that, is, that we're still embedded with today. So with that as our backdrop, our context, I want, you to, I want to consider a couple of trends. And to do so, I defer to uh, Gary Marks, the president of the Center for Public Outreach in Virginia, who is also the author of 21 Trends for the 21st Century out of the trenches and into the future. In his book, and I highly recommend the read, uh, he challenges us to move from a mindset of yesterday thinking while solving today's challenges, but also <laughs> preparing for tomorrow. So the three trends I wanna highlight, the first one is trend number one is uh, in a series of tipping points, majorities will become minorities creating ongoing challenges for social cohesion. I think that we're all seeing that with the current events that we're dealing with in Charlottesville, um, unfortunately. But when you look at the US Census Bureau, by 2030, one in five of us will be 65 or older. <laughs> it's hard to believe that I'll be one of those as a baby boomer's age. By 2044, no single subgroup of Americans will be in the majority. And by 2060, 20% of us will have been born in foreign country. Trend number two. Mark suggests that pressure will grow for society, produce, uh, uh, prepare people for jobs and careers that may not currently exist. One of my favorite LinkedIn connections is following the work of Thomas Fry, senior futurist at Da Vinci Institute, and he also is the, uh, the top Google uh, hit for uh, futurists. He suggests that 60% of jobs 10 years from now haven't been created yet. Furthermore, in 2030, and I pause on that for a second because this year's kindergartners who are entering our schools right now are gonna graduate in 2030. So as they graduate, the world will have seen over 2 billion jobs disappear, mostly from artificial intelligence and robotics at this point as, as we look forward, with some of them coming back in different forms, different industries, and, and, and some of them coming back not as jobs but as projects. He also predicts that 50% of today's Fortune 500 companies will be gone and 50% of traditional colleges will have collapsed. And really interesting to note, he predicts that the world's largest internet company will be in the education business. And he goes on to say that that company hasn't been invented yet. Trend number three, Mark suggests that we need to release the ingenuity and stimulating creativity and will become the primary uh, responsibility of education and society. Now this graph I find really, really intriguing. It, it's, it's a little bit outdated, but I think it still holds true today. So Dr. Yang Zhao, professor at the University of Oregon, takes the 2009 math PISA results, and that's represented by the red bars. And if you, I don't know how clear it is on your screen, but Singapore is leading, Republic of Korea is second, and the United States comes in 18th out of the 23 countries on this graph. Then he overlays that with the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor Perceived Entrepreneurial Capabilities. And the way that uh, the, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor comes up with these ratings is by measuring the behaviors and attitudes of individuals in these countries and the national context of how it, is, it, it impacts their uh, entrepreneurial capabilities or opportunities. What Yang Zhao suggests is that there's nearly a direct inverse relationship between standardized test score performance and a country's creativity. I find that really fascinating. So Marx concludes by saying basically that our kids today, certainly moving forward, 
will need the skills that were only known to diplomat a decade or so ago. However, we're still saddled with the challenges of how we handle our students, um, uh, how we engage our students, the disruption of our students, um, and, and, and the way we intervene. According to a 2013 report by Tavis Smiley at PBS, 40% of students expelled every year in the United States are African American. 70% of school arrests are African American or Hispanic. 68% of all the inmates don't have a high school diploma. And our, our students of color are, are twice as likely not to graduate than their white peers. In addition, Associated Press came out just recently with an article saying that the cost of a, housing a prisoner in California now exceeds the cost of a, a student attending Harvard for a year. And for the first time, there's been costs associated with suspension. So the UCLA Civil Rights Project last year published a report suggesting that we are, suspensions are costing us $35 billion a year. And the way they came up with that is I put it here in text. More suspensions, this is a quote from, from their, uh, the article, more suspensions lead to dropouts, about 67,000 students annually they, that they track from suspension to dropout, which then is lost revenue, tax revenue as productive citizens, as well as cost on, on social costs of uh, welfare, health care, and uh, uh, criminal costs. So essentially, suspensions they are projecting at a minimum are costing us $35 billion a year. So my challenge statement is this. As we move forward, as our society is aging out, the boomers are, are, are hitting retirement age, and we're becoming so much more diverse. But at the same time, according to Equal Opportunity Schools, in collaboration with College Board, International Baccalaureate Organization, U.S. Department of Education, Education Trust, there's at least 640,000 students of color or poverty every year who have the skills and ability to be in our most advanced courses, but they miss out on that opportunity. So the challenge is, can we look at our policies, our intervention strategies, our culture, our climate, and can we do a better job of engaging all of our students and, and not so quickly losing the amount of talent that we're losing every year to the tune of the cost of society of $35 billion? So how do we set up all students to succeed? I believe that students are challenged, develop the skills of perseverance in part because we believe in them, so therefore they believe in themselves. I don't know if you folks are familiar with Todd Rose. He's a former high school dropout, has an amazing TED Talk. I recommend that you, 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 you Google him up. And it's about a 20-minute TED Talk on his experience of public education, profound um, speech that he delivers. And he leaves us with this thought that the hardest part of learning something new is not embracing new ideas, but letting go of the old ones. And I suggest that's our suspension dilemma. So moving forward, how do we ensure our students' success, all students? First of all, they need to have access to rigorous curriculum. Second of all, I suggest that we examine school policies and our intervention strategies. But maybe most importantly, we implement a mixed measurement set of tools to identify those who are qualified candidates for our, our most rigorous curriculum. And then we implement a multi-tier system of support. Um, I was fortunate to, to use AVID in, in my day as superintendent, uh, but one thing I missed completely on, and if I were to go back tomorrow, I would engage with the social emotional learning strategies, tools, measures. And then lastly, I think we've got to really do a good job of engaging our entire community in these conversations because for us to move ourselves to today thinking, much less tomorrow thinking, we've got to let go of yesterday and our community has to be involved in that, that process or they rebel against us. So a couple of districts I'd like to highlight that I think have done an exceptional job and data supports the work that they're doing are Highline Public Schools, south of Seattle, and Valverde Unified School District in Southern California. So I think it's about four, maybe five years ago, Susan Enfield, Superintendent of Highline, um, went through the process of engaging the community in a strategic plan conversation, and they came away with six strategy areas. Mastery of course subjects by grade three, success in algebra by grade nine, the rigorous graduation rate, 
zero suspensions except when critical for student staff safety. And then students will be bilingual, biliterate, tech savvy, and tech literate. And I love the Highline promise. Know every student by name, strength, and need, and that they graduate ready for college, career, and citizenship. So implementing these ideas and, of course, many more strategies that support those concepts. Just since 2013, Highline has seen a growth in, in their African American Latino students and their AP and IB classes by 20% and significantly increased graduation rates African American students by 18% to 73 and Latino students from 50% to 71. At the same time, reduced out of school student suspensions by about 80% to 450 this past school year. Now, in an ASCD article uh, that was recently published, she is quoted as basically saying that the mindset that these students need to be punished more than their peers led to significantly lower rates, lower rates of minority students taking those advanced classes. And she also suggests at the, uh, at the end of the article that we'll never be able to make this easy. Even on our best days, with everything in place, it's hard work. And on the hard days, it's soul crushing. On the good days, it'll lift you up. So I just a shout out to Highline. I think Mark Finstrom's on the line, the CIO of, of, of Highline. They're doing great work up there. Valverde School District in uh, Southern California, south of Riverside, and their superintendent, Mike McCormick, again, have built a vision, vision for the future that you're looking at on your screen now. So they, they basically have taken uh, the four C's of Ken K's 21st century learners, added a flexibility of, of a student learning path, supported by multi-tiered suspension, uh, <laughs> supports, I apologize for the Freudian slip there. <clears throat> and in that embedded uh, AVID, they've embedded, as you can see, a lot of different uh, strategies, but also focused on social emotional learning, positive behavior supports, and then applied Fullen's coherence and the right drivers uh, to be deployed in action. And look at the results that Valverde is experiencing. 20,000 students, um, I think, if not, approximately 100% minority students, 84% living in poverty. They have leapfrogged in the last uh, five years. They've leapfrogged the state and county averages in the California course requirements being met by their students. They've increased their graduation rates in their community to 93.2%, decreased defiant classroom suspensions by 75% to 2015. Mike thinks that that's probably down to about, eight, or up to about 85, 90% reduction. And then another statistically significant uh, piece of information, they've decreased their cohort dropout rate since 2010 from 16.7% to 3.4% by just believing in all students and implementing a coherent set of strategies to ensure their success. So, Going back to the PISA that I, I showed earlier in 2009, something pretty interesting that happened in the last release of PISA results. And I'm gonna read this slide to you. This is from December 9th, uh, this, this last December. The Asia Society writes, comparing across countries, the PISA demonstrates that poverty need not be destiny. And commenting in particular on the United States performance, Andrea Schleicher from OECD, suggests that the most significant encouraging findings were the United States improvement on equity. So this can be done, and it's, finally, it, it's really interesting to me that PISA is even beginning to measure equity versus excellence and getting away from just the focus on a standardized test. And as I kick it over to Julie to talk about some, some tools moving forward, I leave you with this quote from Thomas Friedman, the author of The World is Flat. Julie? Kick it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I um, I'm just going to open up this. Uh, I'm going to unmute all the um, all the attendees. I'm just going to take everybody off mute for a moment. Um, hopefully, the background noise won't be too much. To see if there's any questions. That was great, Rob. And uh, I know um, Mark Finstrom from Highline. Uh, there was a shout out from. Uh, Rob, to you on that, and, and I know you have some comments uh, in the chat box, so I'm going to just ask you to, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to repeat what you said in the chat box, if you wouldn't mind, Mark, are you out there? Sure, I can do that. Can you hear me okay? I can. Good. 
So, Rob, it's always a pleasure working with you. Thank you for uh, calling out Highland. I, I, you know, having partners like GuideGate 12 and uh, thought leaders like you as we work together through these things is what makes a difference because you can't do it all yourself. You got to have people who support you and have the same vision and direction and guidance. And then we feed off of each other, which obviously is a positive result for everybody else who uses the product such as Guide K-12. So thanks again, Rob. Well, you're welcome, Mark. And thank you for uh, um, the work that we've done together. Um, for, for those who are listening in right now, um, uh, when I was superintendent, I was in Federal Way, contiguous to Highline, and I've known Mark and uh, Susan Enfield and, and, and the folks in Highline for many years now. And uh, I still live up in the area. In fact, Mark, we could, we could be sitting in the same room right now. <laughs> we could be, yes. All right. Um, I am just switching over to take take over the screen. Are you? Um, uh, we're not seeing my screen yet. Uh -huh. You know, Julie, why, why you're doing that, I just want to uh, continue a little bit with the thoughts on, on the work that Mark and Susan have done. Um, and, and she said in that quote uh, in the ASG, ASCD update, this is hard work. And I really am inspired by what you guys have done up in Highline because um, it's been a heavy lift and, and you've gotten pushback. It's not just been this uh, thing, hey, we're going to you know address the needs of all kids. We're going to reduce suspensions and we're going to, you know, uh, whistle our way to work. It's been a heavy lift and you've taken a lot of criticism. I really admire the fact that you've all hung in there, worked so well together and really are seeing, you know, she, she says that you guys aren't a success, a success story. I disagree. She says that you're a success story in the making. Well, I think you've exceeded that, but again, I just want to congratulate you guys on the great work you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd like to echo that. Highline has been a, a great partner for us, and, and uh, we continue just to see some great work going on in that district across the board. And, you know, one of the goals with this session it was really to, um, and Rob did a, a great job of kind of setting up this challenge and, and having people think about um, how, how it's being addressed, but also by bringing some tools and, uh, and showcasing some things that other districts are doing. One other district that, um, I'd like to, to give as an example is um, Lafayette Parish. They had um, been looking across the board at their where their ESL programs or their ELL programs were located across their district. And um, with the help of Guide K-12 and being able to geographically locate students on the map by being able to understand where the students live and where they attend. And that's really the power, one of the big powers of, of um, Guy K-12, Lafayette Parish was able to understand that where they were offering some of their programs was not exactly where the students lived. And so they were spending more money in transportation. The kids were spending more time on those buses. And they actually had a lower participation rate of some of those programs because they were not convenient. And so the families were opting out of programs that were going to benefit them. And with Guide K-12's help, what they were able to do is relocate those programs into areas that more students had greater need. And they saw an increase in program use go up. They saw a decrease in transportation costs. Um, and so I'm just gonna give you a four minute overview of kind of an example that fits in with um, part of what I was just talking about, but also what Rob was talking about because what Guy K-12 does is we take the student from um, student information system data and merge it with county and property data. So every student becomes mapped to their rooftop uh, down to the every household, even multifamily dwellings, apartments, complexes. You can see every dot of uh, every student. Um, and we can filter on any attribute that's coming out of the student information system. So however you track this is customized by your district. So if you track you know, 50 ethnicities, if you've got 150 home languages, it's all in there. And for today's example, I was just going to follow up, um, follow through with what Rob was talking about is advanced coursework. So I'm picking some AP classes um, and I'm going to look at just students that are in high school. Um, so I'm going to uh, select grades 9 through 12. Um, these colors that you're looking at, these are the boundaries for this particular um, district. This is a demo 
uh, instance, so you're not seeing any real students um, data. This um, We take data privacy very seriously, so you are not seeing um, real students. This is a real geography, um, but the, the rest of the information has been altered for privacy's sake. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and t turn on the students, um, and you'll see all the dots appear on the map because that's, this is where the students live um, and the high schools that they're attending. Of all of the students that are taking AP classes, there's 913. This is a 40,000 student district. So about 913 high schoolers are enrolled in the AP courses across this district, and you can see percentage-wise by what schools. Um, so now if I wanted to look at it from some different aspects, I can change my mapping. And I could look at it from um, maybe a different perspective, getting to Rob's point on how many students that are um, economically disadvantaged are also taking those classes. And again, looking at this example, in this case, um, the free and reduced students that are, or the students that are not eligible for free and reduced, so not economically challenged, 91% of those are the AP students. And um, we've got about 9% um, that are free and reduced taking AP classes. So that tells me that I'm, um, this district has about 30% free and reduced. So I am not equally represented in my AP coursework. And that's part of the, the beauty of Guide K-12 is finding things that typically might be lost in Excel spreadsheets or um, not easy to get at and being able to quickly get at that information um, in the matter of a few clicks and putting it closest to those um, that are closest to the decision. So, um, and then if I want to go in and filter further, I could go in and look at, I just want, now want to see on the map those students that are eligible for free and reduced. And maybe I want to even get more specific and look at, um, this district is primarily a white district, so maybe I want to look at everybody um, else in the district of students of color and students within poverty and see what that number looks like. And it quickly shows me that I've got 36 students out of all of those students, the 900 plus students that uh, I had identified as taking AP courses, I can see them now scattered across the district, these 36 students. And one of the things that I find interesting is this area um, down here on the southwest corner is one of the, the most diverse high schools in the district and um, has the fewest dots within. Um, of, so the fewest students participating in AP classes. And so, this is just, and these dots are each live, so I can actually, um, I could contact, these are the students that are actually in AP, but again, if in your SIS you had other ways to identify your students, we could look at how do you quickly find those students and locate um, students that might be good candidates. So it really is just trying to highlight how Guy K-12 can help you really start to see things visually and um, and geographically that might be lost in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, any questions? Comments? All right, I'm gonna send it back um, to you, Bob. Okay, thank you, Julie. I, you know, just for uh, uh, kind of a, disclosure or disclaimer, I guess. I don't know which one it would be. Um, I, I was not a, ga a Guide K-12 uh, client when I was superintendent, and I've, I've told uh, Julie and Chuck and the folks at Guide K-12 repeatedly that um, I, uh, over, the, uh, over the years and then looking back on, on the things that I, you know, did as a superintendent and, and the things that we struggled with, um, I see that these set of tools are really powerful. Um, if nothing else, being able to demonstrate visually what you just demonstrated to show the, the, the challenges or the issues or our, our context that we're operating in, I think is really powerful for uh, any, any superintendent, uh, school board, uh, in, in those conversations with the community about these difficult conversations. Because one of the things, just being honest, that as, as I went through the process of opening up access to students who traditionally were locked out of those opportunities, got a lot of criticism. And uh, basically, you're watering down the, the curriculum. You're, you're, you know, it, I, it, it goes on and on. And at times, it was very ugly. Um, but to have a set of tools that can help you show visually the situation that the, the, your district is in, I think is powerful. So with that, 
as, as we wrap up this session, I, I, I suggest and recommend that folks make a commitment to the changes, not only addressing us now as we become a more diverse uh, society, but how do we engage our students so that they can hey, be part of the solution? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. We can't, see your, we, we can't see your screen. Can you just accept the, the transition? I, um, uh, just show you. Did screen. I do it? Yep. Got it. Thank okay, you. Sorry about that. You know, folks, for what it's worth, this is my first webinar, and I, I've never presented <laughs> where I can't see everybody in the audience. This is brutal. And, and then when my phone wouldn't let me unmute, I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. So thank you for hanging in there with me as I, as I step into the technology age. Um, so as I was saying, thank you, Julie, for, for bringing that to my attention. Um, make that commitment to the change. Um, it's hard work. It's a heavy lift, but it's absolutely essential as we move forward and as we become a more diverse society. Um, it, the issues are complex, but they're simple steps that district leaders can take. And one of them is, how are you sorting out your students? Who's your candidate pool to get these kids in these higher level courses? And how are you changing the culture within your district in, in the process? Examine your demographics and, and making sure that at a minimum, that the students that are enrolled in your, in your advanced coursework reflect the demographics of your community. In far too many cases, the, the disparities are, are, I guess, at, at least egregious. And I would suggest that you engage with tools like Guide K-12 that can quickly help you analyze those very things and making sure that you are, in, I guess, in compliance with your own, uh, your own goals. Um, and then I would, I would ask that we, all of us, as educators, leaders, adults, as citizens, that we take this up as a challenge, as our cause, and that we're doing our part to make sure that our students are prepared to not only, like, as I said earlier, survive but thrive in the, the future that they're going to inherit, a 21st century that is now 17% old. And I always like to say that the solution to a worldwide crisis, and there's enough of them right now, might be found in the heart and the mind of a child that was written off by a system that was long ago sorted based on race or gender. And I cannot wait for the day. And I hope it happens in my lifetime where this just becomes a footnote in Wikipedia and that we are no longer having these kind of conversations because it's our new normal. So with that, I thank you all for attending and would love to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you so much, Rob. I really, really appreciate that. And um, I just appreciate your insight and your experience on all of this. Any questions or comments? Julie, it's Mark. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to uh, uh, state something. I, there was a question inside the the chat box. Of, you know, our guide K-12 doesn't look like that. That's depends on which version you're on as to where you are with the uh, software. So what you saw is what I see, you know, and I enjoy working in some of that version. Uh, yes, you that's wanna, the new I'll, version. Uh, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. I did see that in the chat box. So um, for, um, for those of you that are Guide K-12 users, what I was showing is the new suite that is rolling out to everybody um, starting this fall. So we have done a complete user interface update um, and modernized the look and feel. And so you will all see um, the same view that, uh, that I was showing. Uh, that was kind of a preview of what uh, the new guy K-12 looks like. So we're really excited about that. So thank you for bringing that up. I'm glad you, you caught that. I'm really appreciative of that. Um, I have a question, Rob, for you. As you mentioned AVID, what is AVID? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I always tell people, advise people not to talk in acronyms because we are so heavy in those in, in, uh, in education. Um, it's advancement via individual determination. It's basically a curriculum and uh, a supporting skill sets that are taught to students. It's, in particular, it was, it was originally designed for first-generation college-going students, um, it's in, in particular uh, students of color in urban centers. Um, and it's a really rigorous curriculum with those skills that will help them be able to handle the rigors of a, an advanced coursework uh, high school or K-12 experience, but then also prepare them for a college experience. Perfect. 
perfect. I appreciate and, that. And, and Julie, I just, I'll just, I'll just add that, that, you know, as superintendent back in the day when we were expanding our access to our kids of color and, and kids in poverty, basically the kids that were are traditionally not represented in, in the advanced coursework, AVID was significant in ensuring that students were ready to make that leap and that we could debunk the myth that they're not ready to learn. So when when you were using that, you were using things other than just test scores, or what what were you doing to open well, up advanced coursework and not using maybe quote traditional methods? What else were you doing? Well, it, it's kind of I'll, I'll go back to my days as a high school principal where I was trying to take out the the course catalog language of prerequisites and opening up access to AP courses and just at a war with my staff over that issue. Um, and then every year uh, I would look at the course catalog when it went to print and came out and that, that language was still in there. That happened year after year after year, even as I went from principal to central office to superintendent in the same district. So that, that's one part of this. When, when in a federal way, what, I inherited a, a set of uh, policies that the board had approved and then we, we implemented based on a, a, tri a triangulation of data. Could, kids could pass or students could pass either the uh, prerequisite course. And, and I want to say that we were uh, a standards-based curriculum before Common Core. So we had already built a, uh, the, the, the folks in Federal Way had already built their standards-based curriculum with learning targets to meet each standard, very intricate uh, uh, curriculum sequence. So if students passed those standards, they were eligible. If students passed the state exam, they were eligible for AP or IB or if they passed the PSAT, which we administered during the school day free of charge back in the day before anyone else was doing that, we did that. And so if they passed any one of those three, they were automatically placed in AP or IB classes. But the other thing is if they didn't pass those and they still wanted in, they raised their hands, said they wanted in, we put them in. Because um, just really believe that, that, that students who want that rigor, that qualify for that rigor, need to be in that, in those classes. So AVID was a real important piece of supporting that work, but that was our the best that we had at that time of how we could identify those students. So that's why I say when I see your tools and what you can do to identify students, I just start to salivate. <laughs> I appreciate that and I appreciate the the uh, expanded view on how how you opened up the classwork and uh, or the course um, opened up the opportunities and then how identifying students um, would, would really um, benefit an administrator. So with that, is there any other questions or comments that uh, – oh, I do see um, um, a couple questions that have come in. Uh, will there be training on the new suite? Yes, uh, there will be for the Guy K-12 um, current customers. We've got, I believe it's September 19th and 27th. We have – two demo dates that are uh, going to be uh, sent actually next week for everybody to sign up and, and actually get a new uh, a demonstration of all of the new um, functionality of Guy K-12. And then um, the trainings will begin in October. Um, so everybody will get hands-on and start to, to train. Um, and then um, I see a note saying that we've got some middle schools in our district using AVID. Are they tracked in Guy K-12, they definitely could be. Um, I can't speak to the specifics for that district, but if that is something that is a um, data point that is in the SIS or in a separate database, it can definitely be fed in, and so somebody could be um, could be looking at um, the data from AVID um, in Guy K-12. So uh, I love it when those two things come together. So thank you for the questions. Anything else? Okay, thank you everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, we have recorded this, so I will be posting it to the Guy K-12 website. Thanks again, everybody. And again, Rob, thank you. Oh, you bet, Julie. Thank you, and thank you, everybody.